because that was called son of a bitch. Wait, god damn it, wait! I'm dying, but I don't know why I found that funny. Why would you make the respawn point where the car runs you over? But yeah, infinite lives, and you need them. These games can be brutal. It all depends on how you play. Are you stealthy? You can play it that way for sure. I think it's mandatory for some of these levels, and if you ask me, it's more satisfying. I play recklessly only when I can get away with it, unless you give me lethal fist and I can't fucking control myself. The enemies have amazing eyesight and hearing, selectively. Further emphasis on selectively. If you're so much in the same room as they are, they'll know. They don't even have to look at you. But they can also be as dumb as rocks, a factor you can exploit. You shoot a gun, attract their attention, and then just mow them down. They go to the spot that made the sound, not necessarily the source. So when you understand that, they can be no problem. But that won't mean much in the bigger maps where there are little to no places to hide. And let's just say the enemies will often see you but you won't see them. At least with the close range mooks, they have to get up close and personal to murder you, but anyone with a gun will waste you faster than you can blink, and that goes double for the damn dogs. These games, despite how simple they look, can go from 0 to 100 in seconds flat. But even though they only clock in around 5 to 6 hours, they're pretty mindless. You kill things, and that's all there is to it. And that's honest to god not an oversimplification. And there's an audience for good old mindless action. I love Smash TV and its game show setup. It was a lovable exaggeration of the 80s action movie. The trippy presentation here makes it feel as if this game doesn't want to be fun. It's filled with dark humor, and I know the amount of gore, all these blood and guts is just so over the top it's utterly ridiculous. But it doesn't feel like it's played for laughs, unlike something like The Binding of Isaac. Hotline Miami wants to make you uncomfortable, and depending if you like drug films or not, there's a good chance it will. If I were to recommend this to someone, I would only tell them to play it in small spurts, because any longer than an hour, and you may see how repetitive it is. These are better suited for a handheld, so Android users and PlayStation Vita owners are somewhat at an advantage. By the way, the second game assumes you played the first, not because of the plot, but it's a lot harder for one thing. They broadened the level design, making the stealth approach harder to pull off, and it's more difficult to get higher scores. Certainly not beginner-friendly compared to how the first game started up, so watch yourself. A phenomenal soundtrack, though, that flawlessly captures the late 80s and early 90s culture, and in my case, it helped ease the pain of the reputatious nature of Hotline Miami. The soundtrack costs as much as the game. That's how much they think it's worth. That takes balls, but I do like me some Roller Mobster. That's a sick-ass beat. So who's ready to end this next indie showcase? Alright then, you guys know what's up next, so... Wait, what? Fucking hell, already? Hell yeah! Yeah? Five Nights at Freddy's 4 is out! Already working on it. Well, wait for me, goddammit, I'll get the coffee. Okay, well, I guess I'll quickly handle Five Nights at Freddy's 4 first, and then I'll review ABG and Adventures. Ellie, how do I get this thing to stop? End the video. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you guys for watching. Have yourselves a fantastic night, and take care. Oh, for God's sake, it's still going! John, just get in here already. I'm coming, I'm coming. Once again, I was down there, and then shut the door the very instant you hear loud breathing. Five Nights at Freddy's 4 emphasizes sound like you wouldn't believe, and every other game had some element of sound to the game, but it was mostly for atmosphere and to fuck with your head. It's a bonafide gameplay element here. Like it or not, you need to play the game with a respectable level of volume. With headphones, because sound cues are how you're going to stay alive. You listen for footsteps to know if the animatronics are walking around the halls. And you listen for breathing when you think they're right next to the door. This is very, very important, because if you flash your light when they're close to you, they jump scare you. But if you close your door without listening for breathing first, and they just happen to be across the hallway when you do that, you just gave them an open invitation to your frontal lobe. Freddy and Foxy are handled a bit differently, but checking on them is just as important, considering how close they always are, and multitasking is once again just part of the total challenge. It's kind of weird, isn't it? What's stopping these gargantuan robots from just barging into the room at once and grabbing the kid? He's a kid. The doors don't even have locks on him. What the hell's a flashlight gonna do? And Foxy? Foxy starts outside the hall like the others, but when he heads inside the room, he goes for your closet first. Not the kid. <laughs> don't know how to work a doorknob! My hands are rusted open, man! Well, I can try to, but from that- ah, Jesus! What the hell was that? Let me just take my picture! Uh, we'll try to do it again tomorrow. This is a nice closet. It doesn't look much different, but it plays almost nothing like the other games. Whether you're new to the series or a returning veteran, everyone will be thrown for a loop. And this game is pretty friggin' hard. Pretty freaking hard? It's fucking impossible. I was there. You got your ass kicked. Well, I didn't see you play much of it. Because I'm fucking terrified. Yes, and I 
feel comfortable in saying this. Five Nights at Freddy's 4 is the scariest game in the series. Building up anticipation through sound is one of the worst ways you can give me the jitters. It pains me that I even have to wear headphones to properly play this. I know something's out there. I think I can hear some sort of noise, but I won't know for sure unless I flash my light at the pitch black hallway. Even if there is nothing there, there could be a chance they're over at the other door, or maybe under the bed, or maybe the closet. FNAF 4 doesn't just exploit the logical fears of a child, it fucks with a human being's primal fear of the unknown. You gotta put up with this for six in-game hours for five nights, and slipping up just once, whether you didn't listen closely enough or perhaps your fingers just slipped, makes Uncle Fredbear greet you with a big old bear hug. Take it from me, as a guy who loves the Five Nights at Freddy's series. This game will kick your ass and make your heart pound, as if you're actually being hunted by your worst nightmares. Let's put it this way. Scott Cawthon had to patch the game just so people could have an easier time hearing things. Otherwise, people would flip their shit over every little sound and couldn't distinguish it from robot breath. I wouldn't say you'd be as terrified as the kid you play as, but come on, John couldn't finish this game. Hey, if you ask me, it does its job too well. I'm a defenseless kid. There's nothing I can do about these animatronics approaching my child's safety doors. Give me a gun or a rocket launcher, and maybe we can talk about something here. Pull your ball hair out was part of the joke. But there comes a point where if you're not careful enough with the parody, you end up playing the mock troll completely straight. This game made me an angry video game nerd. Mother of fuck balls, I wanted to crack my controller in two after dying from bullshit like death blocks and the fucking ground control. I slipped off the edge more times than Luigi with butter under his greasy shoes. I was enraged when I discovered that deer shit can go through walls. And who the fuck thought that a naked grandma on witch on a broom was a good idea? I don't drink Rolling Rock, but after playing this shit, I still wouldn't drink it. I'm more of a Dos Equis guy in coffee. You know, when I completed this, and after I laid the final hit on Fred Fox... I didn't have any real sense of accomplishment. You know, it, it wasn't anything like grabbing the final orb after whipping Dracula or grabbing the Triforce of Courage in Zelda 2. It was just a sigh of relief. You know, I'm not sure whether or not it was because it was finally over or uh, the fact that I only paid five bucks for this game. So the bottom line here is, if you were to ask me whether or not you should get this, well, do you enjoy the AVGN? Are you eager to purposefully put yourself in a game that doesn't pull punches through intentionally archaic design? Then go for it. I don't consider AVGN Adventures to be a shitty game that sucks ass, but again I stress that I believe a lot of enjoyment stems from whether or not you're willing to run along with the joke. If you're not up for that, then AVGN Adventures will probably just be a frustrating, unforgiving, hard as cold balls throwback to the laughing, joking numb nuts that were shitty video games. And all of this was just on the normal difficulty. If you can conquer this shit on old school or higher, give yourself a fucking medal. Still, it's awesome that this game exists at all, and it really goes to show how far along the man has come, and achievements like that are what drive me to you know, further pursue my goals. This is my 100th Johnny Versus video. And it feels so appropriate that the subject matter of that benchmark is the motherfucker that helped inspire me in the first place. As long as there's a video game out there and as long as there's someone to entertain with a video review, this train ride ain't never stopping. But I got a feeling you guys are a little sick of the indie scene, so here's what's happening. The next few reviews are going to be on modern games, but while that's going on, you guys should go to vote on what the next marathon is going to be between these three franchises. Mother, because I get a lot of requests on that one, Metal Gear in celebration of the Phantom Pain, and Star Fox in celebration of Star Fox Zero coming out on the Wii U. Now these are the next three marathons I'm handling regardless, but you guys are going to determine which franchise gets looked at first, so vote away. And again, and again, and again, and again. Thank you all very much for sticking by with me for over 100 video game reviews. You know, this channel is going through some changes pretty soon, and it's all thanks to your continued support and devotion. I am very happy to entertain the likes of you all. With all that said, thank you guys for watching. Have yourselves a fantastic night, and take care. Because fuck Isle Delfino. My apologies. Splatoon also has amiibo support, but don't go crazy if you can't find these things in the stores. The content you unlock is superfluous. Cosmetic at best. And your reward most of the time is cash, which is always nice, but you can score more moolah in online mode. The only real reward for using amiibos is the exclusive gear, like the school uniform for the female inkling. This is nifty, but nothing beats a cozy t-shirt and a hat. Yeah, I'm lame, I know. But it's important to stress Splatoon is much, much better with friends to play with online. There's local multiplayer, but it's this incredibly lame target practice. You shoot balloons. That's it. 
There isn't even a co-op story mode or anything of the sort. Maybe in another free update, but I doubt that. And that's something that should be seriously considered for the eventual sequel. Couch multiplayer is still a thing, goddammit. We're not all connected to the Matrix just yet. There's still fucking time! There's already something enticing about the game's wacky, upbeat appearance and very easy to understand mechanics. Everything just connects together well when you have other people to play with live, preferably with an online chat going on. It's also a safe alternative for the younger crowd if parents don't want their kids playing the more hardcore shooters like Call of Duty or Battlefield. Not to put those games down, but they're rated M for Mature for a reason. So if you plan on playing online with a bunch of friends, Splatoon is very much worth it. I didn't even mention how fun Splatfest can be. Unfortunately, I just missed the last one before I recorded footage for this video. But to explain real quick, it's a competition Splatoon holds every once in a while, where you choose between two things. Do you enjoy cats or are you more of a dog person? Roller coasters or water slides? Autobots or Decepticons? And that last one wasn't a joke. They actually made a deal with Hasbro to have Transformers as the subject of the last Splatfest. You pick a side and then you play online matches. And the better you do, the better your choice does until the winner is ultimately decided a couple of days later. It's a really fun form of rivalry, and I'm anxious to see what other Splatfest competitions show up later, like... Maybe Super Nintendo vs. Sega Genesis, or Top vs. Bottom. Nah, I'm kidding. But if you plan on playing this by yourself, I would definitely wait for a price drop. The single-player content doesn't offer much besides goofy characters and cool ideas. And competing online just isn't the same if you don't have someone to trash talk to. Isn't that right, Ted, you piece of shit? I kid, I kid. But why didn't you help me defend the fucking tower? That was Arwen. It was Arwen! So make sure you got some friends with Splatoon before you yourself get Splatoon. It could be a great time together. And as for my next review, I'm heading back to Gotham City for Batman Arkham Knights. And I'm looking at the PlayStation 4 version be because of the 60s Batman costume. I just can't help myself. But we're going to see the last game in the Arkham series is more than just added costumes for the Batman. Also, the straw poll for the next marathon is getting really interesting. Metal Gear and Mother are basically neck and neck while Star Fox sweeps in a corner. But again, this straw poll won't end until I review Super Mario Maker, so there's still plenty of time to make your choice count. And as always, thank you guys for watching, have yourselves a fantastic night, and take care. Hello there kids and squids, if you have the time, I'd greatly appreciate it if you took a look at some of my other videos. Just click the annotations on the highlighted footage and give them a watch. Who knows, maybe I can recommend you something you never- Played, or, or make you play something- I mean, I laughed at a few of these, but this is one of the glitchiest Arkham games I've ever played. And this is after the game already got like three, four gigabyte plus patches. At this rate, Arkham Knight's going to fill up my PS4 all on its own. But about that $40 season pass, is it worth it? Well, we got three story packs involving Harley Quinn, Red Hood, and Batgirl. The first two lasting about 20 minutes, while Batgirl's scenario is a bit meatier. We have a few challenge packs involving the Bat Family and more costumes for the Batman. I won't lie, I was giddy as fuck for the 1989 Batman costume, complete with the 1989 Batmobile, but you can only use it for races, since it doesn't have a battle mode, which is bullshit! It had guns in the 1989 movie, and it blew up the Ace Chemical Plant with tire bombs! Ah well, but the exclusive racetracks that are based off of the 1989 film in Batman Returns are pretty cool. I bought the season pass knowing I was going to review this game, and I enjoy some of the content, but the story packs feel more like prototypes than full-out content. I like controlling Harley Quinn and Red Hood, but these campaigns are so incredibly short they feel almost pointless. There's still a couple of months worth of content left to unlock, but I think you're better off waiting for the inevitable Game of the Year edition if you don't want to spend over $100 for the complete package. As for the main game... I have to say this is the weakest entry in the series for me, but don't take that as me saying the game is bad. No, it's still a remarkably solid action-adventure game starring the Dark Knight. The combat is still as good as it ever was, same goes for the stealth game, and the Batmobile is a great tool for getting around the city and for getting out of those tight spots. Graphically, it's fucking gorgeous and showcases what the current generation is capable of putting out, and nearly everything is rendered in real time. That means the Adam West costume for every occasion. The campaign, on the other hand, is a weak point. I'm not very captivated by the plot. The things to do in Gotham City are not very interesting. It's either straight up boring or wearisome to almost ludicrous degrees, like the militia stuff. Did I mention how this game also gets boss fights wrong when they got that part right in Arkham City? Who goofed up there? This warrants a revisit at some point. Maybe I'll provide an update when every piece of DLC is released because that's just the nature of how things work nowadays, especially with Warner Brothers. I love the Arkham games, and Arkham Knight is fine as is, but I feel it missed the mark on being the greatest Batman game ever made. This is the grand finale of the Arkham series, but I hope this doesn't spell the end for great Batman games. Well, whatever the case, I wish Rocksteady Studios and WB Montreal the best of luck with whatever they plan on doing from this point on. Anyway, that's a wrap for the Batman.
for now. I got a feeling this isn't the last time we'll see him. But while he spends his time brooding in his cave, I got other games to look at. And that straw poll, man, Metal Gear and Mother are still so freaking close, and it's almost time to close up voting. Who will win? Find out next time. Same bat time, same bat channel. Thank you guys for watching. Have yourselves a fantastic night, and take care. Oh,